This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Catherine Shen. So much of the work we do as journalists depends on one small but mighty law, the Freedom of Information Act, or FOIA. It requires government and public authorities to disclose information on request. FOIA is just one of the legal protections often associated with Connecticut native and consumer advocate Ralph Nader. It's known as a sunshine law, so-called for increasing transparency in government or business. By turning the lights on, the likelihood of corruption and negligence decreases. Coming up, we'll discuss Nader's lifelong mission of leaving the lights on. He pushed for transparency within the automotive industry in the 60s, well before his well-known presidential runs. He was also instrumental in the creation of the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, and more. We'll also talk about his upbringing and recent journalism venture in Winstead. But first, Nader doesn't often praise big business leaders, but in his new book called The Rebellious CEO, he profiles a dozen who he says did it right. And Ralph Nader is with us now to discuss everything that I just mentioned. Ralph, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Catherine. And for our listeners, you can join the conversation. Leave us a comment on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. So, Ralph, obviously must begin with your new book. And I know you get this question a lot because you wrote a book. But given your track record on corporate America, I have to ask, what inspired you to write The Rebellious CEO? Well, over the years, you know, there's been a lot of criticism of bad CEOs of large companies all the way to recent criticism of the opiate manufacturers, for example, uh, the water polluters in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, the Boeing 737 MAX uh, disaster, uh, Wall Street's overreach of investors. And whenever they are uh, challenged, they often just say, well, we're just responding to market demand. it's not our fault. This is what the consumer wants and willing to pay for. And although that's a very deficient explanation because monopolistic, deceptive practices, uh, disadvantaging uh, corporate welfare from Washington against small businesses, uh, all kinds of corporate criminal activity uh, distorts any kind of market uh, feedback. Uh, but there, there isn't any yardstick. Uh, there isn't any contrast or comparison uh, on behalf of CEOs who got it right. So you can say to the CEOs of the banking, insurance, uh, auto, Exxon Mobil, hey, you know, these people met the bottom line. These companies made profit, but they respected the environment. They respected consumers. They treated their workers well. They were interested in civic pursuits for a more just community where their offices and plants were. And so don't don't tell us that you're just responding to the market and are not responsible uh, for your harm or, or other uh, disadvantageous impacts you have uh, on climate and, uh, and uh, uh, health care and banking, etc. So that's why I wrote this book, because these are 12 CEOs I've known over the years. And they're remarkable people. Uh, They had a vision to start their company, and they reversed the business model. Uh, They didn't just say, well, here's a vision to make a lot of money, and we're going to treat the workers and consumers uh, accordingly to meet that maximizing profit. No. Southwest Airlines is a perfect example of that, where Herb Kelleher, who started it in Texas, he was a lawyer, he uh, he completely reversed the business model. Uh, I would be flying out of Southwest at uh, Bradley, and I would notice how wonderful uh, the uh, stewards and stewardesses were. They 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 bent over backward to to tell you yes, you can do something that you want done, instead of some airline employees who are told to keep saying no. It's company policy. So I called up Herb and I said, you know. It's really great the way you're putting the consumer as your highest priority. And he said to me, I'm not putting the consumer as highest priority. I said, what do you mean? He said, I'm putting my people as highest priority. He never used the word 
employee or staff, mm-hmm. called them people. He said, I, I, because we treat our people well in all kinds of ways, they treat the passengers well. And that means that more passengers want to fly southwest, and that makes the shareholders happy. So that, it's that reversal of the business model. And they practiced what they preached. Right. Well, and you just mentioned one of the remarkable qualities that these leaders share, that they weren't guided by the bottom line. And they do, while they do pay attention to profits, but they didn't avoid you know, speaking out against injustices um, for fear that it would offend customers or cause political retaliation or hurt the bottom line, which is what you wrote in your book. But I want to ask, you know, what do you think has made this characteristic and sort of striking this balance here either less appealing or more difficult to achieve over the years? Well, I think, you know, I hate to say this, Catherine, but it probably goes back to their upbringing. (laughs) You know, we we can sort of praise their parents uh, because they had wildly varying personalities, but very, very common character traits. For example, uh, they admitted their mistakes in public to put more pressure and get more feedback so they could correct them. That's a pretty rare thing for CEOs uh, over time. They uh, they, they didn't uh, uh, whine much about regulation because they exceeded the regulatory standards. Uh, her, uh, Ray Anderson, uh, who started the, the biggest carpet tile manufacturer in the world out of Atlanta, uh, he, he converted his company to carbon neutrality uh, over 15 years. He's an engineer. And he, he way surpassed uh, environmental uh, standards. Uh, they uh, would criticize their own industry. Uh, the best one in the book on that is Anita Roddick of Body Shop. Withering criticism about the manipulation uh, by the beauty industry, uh, especially of, of teenagers and others, and, uh, and how they... Uh, expose them to harmful uh, cosmetics as well as harmful psychology. And so they, uh, they're they very careful about not overpaying themselves. Kelleher was the lowest paid CEO in the major airlines, and he made more money than all of them put together over a period of years. Some of them lost money regularly, and Delta went bankrupt. Uh, and That's another example. They set an example for their workers. Uh, The head of Apple uh, today, um, Tim Tim Cook, uh, he he made last year eight hundred and thirty three dollars a minute, a minute. Wow. uh, Based on a forty hour uh, week, and um, but they all paid real attention to profits. Bernie Rappaport, who ran the American Income Life Insurance Company out of Waco, Texas, every Saturday morning, he would call every one of his general agents around the country, checking up, suggesting, getting uh, feedback. And uh, so in, in, in many ways, uh, they, set the, they set the practice. And we want people to know about it. There are millions of students who take business courses, you know, right in Connecticut, UConn, Quinnipiac, Yale, elsewhere who need this kind of material uh, so they know uh, that there are higher expectation levels that can be leveled at these CEOs of giant global corporations before they go to work for them. And also, I think this book is very important for leadership uh, training people, period, in community colleges colleges and and, uh, universities. And another thing I realized, Catherine, after I wrote the book, I should have realized it earlier, was all of them came from stable families, that they weren't distracted emotionally by internal family uh, problems. They were supported uh, by by their families uh, across the board. And that's why they could engage in controversial civic activity. It was not just charity, but pushing for justice. Gino Pellucci... Who, who who ran 70 companies he started, including some in his 90s. Uh, one of his civic pursuits was to rescue prisoners in American prisons who were railroaded 
and imprisoned without due process or adequate evidence. And that takes a lot of emotional intelligence and time to do that. Right. And with the potential of this book becoming required reading, Ralph, it's pretty impressive that you get through the book without really mentioning um, many of the well-known or or, or big-name CEOs of today. You mentioned Tim Cook just now. I'm curious if you would share your thoughts about Jeff Bezos and Amazon's growth, too, uh, specifically because the the company has also erected 14 warehouses in Connecticut since 2010. So I'm curious to hear your reaction. You know, what goes through your mind when you're reading about Amazon's presence here in Connecticut? Well, Jeff Bezos has done one really good thing. He rescued the Washington Post, and he's subsidizing uh, this newspaper, which is essential for journalism in America, especially in the nation's capital. But his warehouses have had a lot of trouble. NPR actually had a very strong expose of the dangers and perils to workers in uh, Amazon warehouses some time ago. Uh, One of the reasons why workers are trying to form unions in these warehouses is because uh, the uh, the workplace is just not safe. It's the, the speed up is fantastic. They hardly have time to go to the restrooms. Uh, there are lifting problems, back problems. Uh, and, you know, uh, time is of the essence for uh, Amazon, and they take it out right. of the workers who, which, who are not paid. Uh, that much. Uh, So uh, I tell your listeners to go back and look at that uh, expose that NPR did because it's not out of date. They seem to be be, uh, able to escape OSHA inspection rigors uh, and OSHA penalties, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration in Washington, which I helped get through Congress in 1970, by the way, uh, unfortunately, has very weak penalties. Uh, the, there was a, a worker who was wrongfully uh, injured fatally recently in a factory, not in Connecticut, and OSHA imposed the maximum fine on the company under the law, $13,000. $13,000 for a loss of life in the workplace. So Amazon's lawyers know how to... Uh, circumvent all of this, the state enforcement for workplace safety leaves a lot to be desired. Underfunded enforcement budgets, weak legal authorities in their charter. Uh, So we really have to support these workers. They're not paid that much either. Well, with that support, too, and especially with the example that you just raised, I want to ask you what kind of oversights you would like to see, because there was a recent move in uh, legislation for worker protections in warehouses during the last General Assembly session that we covered here as well. So with what was just said, you know, what sorts of additional oversights would you like to see here? Well, it needs to be more inspectors. I mean, they have so few inspectors in OSHA for millions and millions of workplaces that, that you know, it, it would take years just to see an uh, OSHA inspector come on the, the workplace. There's not enough of them. Uh, the whole budget of OSHA, uh, listen to this one, it's about $600 million a year. This is for millions of workplaces and tens of millions of workers, foundries, factories, office buildings, Uh, transportation, you name it. Well, that's just a little more than what the budget was a few years ago for the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad. It's ridiculously low, and it's kept low by corporate lawyers and lobbyists who swarm over Congress and make sure that tax dollars are not put adequately into OSHA budgets for investigation, for prosecution, and also uh, for establishing updated standards. A lot of the standards for our workplace health and safety out of OSHA are completely obsolete. So we have to pay attention to America here. Uh, you know, we one aircraft carrier now comes in at $14 billion, just one aircraft carrier, which now is pretty obsolete in terms of missile vulnerability. But we have to... Uh, change our priorities from this swollen, bloated military budget supporting empire and endless wars overseas in our name that are boomeranging 
and put it into public budgets for public transportation and upgraded schools and safer workplaces and other public services that the taxpayer has already sent money to Washington but hasn't gotten it back to improve their communities. And so I want to zoom out here a little bit, uh, considering the massive impact of Silicon Valley and also big tech. You know, what sorts of oversights would you like to see there? Well, uh, we're dealing here with the the greatest abduction of our children by corporate greed since slavery. We're looking at Silicon Valley, Facebook or Meta, Instagram, TikTok, all those groups, they're directly targeting these kids at a very young age, even toddlers. They're basically targeting them through that iPhone, undermining parental authority, talk about extreme radicalism, and exposing them to to the worst you can imagine. The new Mexico Attorney General just finished an undercover operation and filed suit against Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg, saying that they are exposing these kids to massive pornography. Uh, It's not Facebook's pornography. It's uh, the way they develop the algorithms, et cetera. These kids are exposed to junk food, junk drinks, violent programming, not to mention very nasty uh, messages that are often anonymous, taking up five to seven hours a day, a day, uh, separating them from their families, community, and nature. How often do you see kids playing in, on the sidewalks anymore? They're all looking at screens. They're all in virtual reality. This has prompted my sister, Dr. Claire Nader, in writing a book last year, directed to tweens, saying, you are your own best teacher, sparking the curiosity, imagination, and intellect of tweens on 50 short subjects that affect them, that aren't taught in their schools, and that will help liberate themselves and make them more self-conscious to how they're being controlled and harmed by these electronic child molesters. Now, what we have to do is regulate him. And there are some bills that have passed through unanimously, uh, however weak they are, in California and Louisiana, uh, which means there's a lot of left-right support for this issue, enormous left-right support, even in Congress. But the support is not translating into strong laws and enforcement. And one of the enforcement mechanisms is to make it a criminal penalty to access these children when they're under 15 years of of age. They're accessing them at eight years, six years, 10 years, making them click on with fine print contracts that tie them up in knots, uh, and they don't even see the contract or understanding what they're clicking on in terms of terms and conditions, as the companies call them. So the first thing is to protect our children. The second is full disclosure. What are these algorithms? Who created them? What are the internal company studies who know, that know that they're harmful to people? And not just children, by the way. Uh, the stuff that's sold, the stuff, the deceptive ex- exposures apply to adults as well. There is a group called Fair Play out of Boston, and they have a staff that focuses on just your question. How do minimize the harm from virtual reality. There's something serious when our children are not spending time in reality, the kind of reality they need to understand before they uh, go into teenage years and adulthood and that they have to grapple with. They're operating in this commercial internet gulag that is designed to maximize the profits and shares of these corporations. And you know, Zuckerberg is worth about $80 billion, and, and others are in that stratosphere as well. This is greed on steroids. I've never seen such uh, insincerity and the lack of compassion uh, to leave our children alone 
with their parents and their siblings and foster a wholesome home environment instead of the commercialization of childhood with direct marketing. When I was growing up, uh, companies didn't did dare direct market to kids, except maybe for bubble gum, Catherine. Right. They would never circumvent parents. Now it's a half a trillion dollar industry directly to very young children all the way to teenage. Well, I was going to say that that is a lot coming coming from you, especially with so much experience that you've had with this industry. And that is certainly a conversation that we are having on an ongoing basis here at Connecticut Public. And with what you just said, too, you know, we may have already touched on one or two industries, but what industries would you say are most comparable to the car industry today? And also within that what would be a winnable fight in your perspective? The drug industry, the pharmaceutical industry is heavily subsidized by we, the taxpayer. They're given tax credits. They're given enormous free research and development right up to clinical trials by the National Institutes of Health. Uh, They're allowed to export their production to China and India thereby creating a national security problem because there is no company producing antibiotics in America. I mean, if the Chinese and Indians cut us off or otherwise divert it to their own needs, uh, where are we? Uh, They are minimally regulated. They're tremendously profitable. And they charge the American people and families the highest prices for their medicines in the world. That's some gratitude. You know, they they were born in the U.S., you know, Merck and Eli Lilly and, and, and others. They rose to profit uh, in the U.S. And, and they started selling abroad in all these countries abroad from Canada, across Europe, Africa. They control drug prices. They don't allow this kind of gouging. So the same drug, exactly the same drug can be bought in Toronto or in Cairo, Egypt, uh, lower price by far uh, in some countries than American patients are charged for. So they're out of control. Uh, Every president keeps saying, you know, Trump, Obama, Clinton, uh, Biden, we're going to control drug prices. They're too high, and they can never get it through Congress. They don't try that hard. But the drug companies have almost 500 full-time lobbyists on Congress, more than one per member of Congress. And of course, they have all the campaign cash that they pump into their coffers. And of course, Congress has a very nice health insurance plan. They don't have to worry about high drug prices. And uh, uh, and they get away with it year after year after year with stupendous uh, profits. Look what they're charging now for the latest vaccine. Uh, if you don't have, if, ha- if you don't happen to have insurance, it's it's multiple times what their cost is. And Moderna was actually subsidized by the, the National Institutes of Health in developing its vaccine, and it's still charging outrageous prices, along with Pfizer, which people, uh, a lot of people, can't afford if they don't have health insurance, and tens of millions of people still don't have health insurance. Oh. The, Bernard Rappaport would always criticize big business. He once talked to a gathering of the Bank of America in California, and he said, you know, uh, you're so big that if you fail, you can pull down the economy. You ought to break yourself up into smaller banks for economic security in our country. <laughs> so they, These CEOs in the book, uh, Bernard Rappaport insisted on having a union in his company. I mean, unions and insurance companies are almost unheard of. And he not only insisted on a union being organized, he joined it himself. Gino Pellucci demanded that there be unions in all his company so he could negotiate with them. He didn't want them unable to collectively bargain. So that's the kind, and they all made money, these companies. So that's the kind of of character that, We have to insist uh, on being emulated by these large corporations. You've been listening to the one and only Ralph Nader. He's out with a new book, The Rebellious CEO. 
We'll continue this conversation after a quick break. You can join us. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Catherine Shen. Back with us for the hour is Ralph Nader, who needs little introduction. For our listeners, you can join the conversation. Leave us a comment on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. So, Ralph, love to go back in time with you to your upbringing in Winstead. You know, how would you describe your early years in small town Connecticut? Well, we were lucky to grow up in a small town where, you know, within 15, 20 minutes, we could go walk to the schools, we could walk to the woods, to the lakes. Town of Winchester, there's a lot of fresh water, three, four lakes, Highland Lake being the largest one. And we could walk to town hall, to the local hospital, the local library, to the stores, uh, we could walk to the county courthouse. Um, it was it, it, that's very important for children. Children today often grow up in large cities where they can hardly see the sky because of the buildings, and they never put their feet on soil. It's all concrete, asphalt. Uh, so that's one thing that was very nice. And, and the second is a. Uh, we had a lucky choice of parents. They had extremely good judgment. We put a lot of these ways they raised us in a, a little book published by Harper Collins called uh, 17 Traditions, which uh, we recommend to uh, parents of young children. Uh, and uh, so that's number two. Uh, number three uh, was that uh, we were given solitude. We weren't over-programmed, over-scheduled. We were allowed to lie on the grass and look up at the trees and watch the squirrels and the butterflies and at night look at the stars and the Milky Way and walk through the the meadows. It's very important for a young child. This is before, you know, there was television that occupied kids today, screens. Uh, and as a result, we were uh, very amenable to our parents taking us to town meetings. My father would take me to the local courtroom where I'd watch the lawyers and judges and jurors uh, try cases, judge cases. Uh, we would be taken to the town meetings, the town meeting form of government, which is the ultimate democracy in our country, where the, the town meeting becomes the legislature. If they don't like what the selectmen are doing, and it can go to referendum. And we would watch the adults talk back and forth. And on our way back home, uh, my parents would discuss what we observed. And that made a very strong, uh, indelible impact on us in the form of civic responsibility. My parents would say, you know, the other side of freedom is responsibility. Because if you don't have responsibility, you're going to lose your freedom. And, and uh, you know, they, they weren't table-pounding, didactic parents. It was very casual. Uh, we watched how they embraced uh, their community responsibilities. My father ran a restaurant on Main Street, Delicatessen, and Bakery. And they used to say, uh, for a dime, you, you got a cup of coffee at Nader's and 10 minutes of political conversation. <laughs> Beautiful. <So. laughs> Well, I, I'm smiling here because as you're describing your upbringing, it sounds like such an enriching childhood. And you've had so many experiences already just being a kid in Connecticut. And another experience you had was you were also a, a paper delivery boy for a local paper in Winston. Yes, I was a paper boy. And it got me into newspapers. Uh, and uh, I had a big route. And I got to knock on a lot of doors or throw the paper on a lot of porches. But I wanted to uh, conclude what all this upbringing resulted in. Sure. My brother was the chief initiator and founder of the Northwest Community College, 
which is among the first community college in Connecticut. It's now rated number one, and it's about 81st out of 1,300 community colleges in the in the country. My sister, when the Litchfield Memorial Hospital closed, um, rallied thousands of citizens in the catchment area, Winstead and Norfolk and Colebrook and, and other towns, Riverton, Barkhamsted, and established the Winstead Health Center, which was an urgent care center, not 24-hour beds, but at least it was it was better than not having a hospital for those many thousands of, of people. Uh, I started the first and only law museum, to our knowledge, in the world, the American Museum of Tort Law, in the place of a community bank that merged with another community bank. We used to go down and put our quarters in our savings account in that bank. Now it's the American Museum of Tort Law. You can take a free tour and learn about the law of wrongful injury. That's what tort law is. People injured by defective products, unsafe chemicals, medical malpractice, um, you know, workplace hazards. There are a lot of exhibits. You can get a free tour. Just go to tortmuseum.org or even better, visit it. It's open Friday, Saturday, and Sunday afternoons. Plenty of free parking. Very nice restaurants nearby. And then Melissa Bird, who's the executive director, would love you to to visit. There's nothing like seeing the actual exhibits and how they respect your intelligence, as one museum goer said to us uh, going out the door. He said, I've seen hundreds of museums. This is the first one that respects my intelligence. Right. And what has the response been to the museum since uh, its opening in 2015? Well, it's it's uh, interesting. People come from all over the world because we have the best tort law in the world with all its warts and trial by jury, which almost no country has for these civil wrongful injury cases. Uh, that's very gratifying. Uh, one was a retired jurist from India who said, I know what you're trying to do. You're trying to bring the law to the people. I said, presto, <laughs> that's exactly what we're trying to do. So we get people from around the country. But it's strange. We don't get that many people within 30 miles of Winston, which includes Hartford and New Britain. And I don't know what the reason is. Uh, it was declared the best new museum in New England by Yankee Magazine in 2016. And people are enthralled by it. They, they come out totally enthralled, totally educated. Uh, it's one of the few museums that can change people's minds instead of all the propaganda about trial lawyers being ambulance chasers uh, using frivolous suits. Uh, there's no evidence to, prov- to uh, support frivolous suits. The judges dismiss frivolous suits. Bingo. Just like that. They're in charge of the courtroom, and lawyers who try to file those kinds of suits lose their credibility in front of the courts, and they don't like to have that uh, occur as well. But there's the Pinto display, asbestos display, tobacco display, Corvair display on the right of privacy issue with General Motors, uh, my lawsuit. There's an occupational hazard uh, display. There's a computer uh, information that you can tap into to see the various cases that led to deterrence. Like uh, there was a case in Washington, D.C., where a woman was uh, assaulted by an intruder in a large apartment building, and she brought suit, and the, the, the court decided that the apartment building was not securely uh, providing locks uh, to make the building safe. Well, that reverberated throughout the entire country. A lot of apartment buildings started looking at their uh, security, their windows, their 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 doors, and so you can see that uh, in in the computer part uh, of the museum. There's a section for youngsters called dangerous toys. Uh, yes, there are dangerous toys, and they're still coming in from overseas. Uh, uh, chemical sets and flammable toys and other things that harm kids. Uh, so it's a wonderful place uh, to visit. 
Well, hopefully uh, our listeners can uh, experience that enthrallment. And again, for for our listeners, you can learn more at tortmuseum.org. And Ralph, we were talking about journalism earlier, and you recently backed a local journalism venture in your hometown, the Winstead Citizen. And we had the pleasure of you calling into the program when we were talking about that. You know, can you tell us about the recent snack with the paper? Was this always a part of the plan, you know, to adapt the business model down the line or have another backer step in? You know, what's going on there? Well, you know, it, it was underfunded. Uh, I helped start it, uh, but but I didn't think that uh, they had to rely on subsidies. They trying to use advertising uh, and subscriptions and go for some nonprofit support. There are now several major foundations in this country to support local journalism. They've emerged with the failure of so many weeklies and other newspapers around the country to try to save local journalism. They put full page ads in the New York Times uh, and and they should be tapped into. Uh, so maybe there'll be another effort uh, to get it underway. But I think that there's plenty of rich money around, plenty of foundations that can sub, uh, subsidize these uh, beyond their advertising and subscription revenue. But it does take mobilizing the readers. They, they've right. gotten used to not having newspapers. And that means there's less voter turnout. There's less uh, turnout at public meetings. It degrades democracy, as NPR knows and has talked about uh, in many interviews. Now, it it really, I think the money is there, but you got to have a core civic mobilization where a small percentage of the citizens in each community get together and make it happen. There are a lot of young journalists and older journalists who've been laid off. Thousands of them have been laid off, maybe tens of thousands the last 20 years. So there's plenty of talent there looking for jobs, but it's got to start with civic mobilization. I think uh, uh, a a woman returned to retire from New York City in Reading, Connecticut. This is no newspaper. And she started one, started Mm -hmm. a weekly newspaper. She mobilized enough citizens to be a critical mass. That's how that's how you get it underway. Well, as a as a former newspaper reporter, newspaper certainly has a special place in my heart. And and of course, with the recognition that it's a it's a very important part of our democracy and, and and Ralph, you mentioning the importance of civic mobilization. You know, with that in mind, what are your concerns about journalism and media big picture? Because the the way people consume news has become increasingly fragmented in recent years. There's so much out there. And uh, this is central to the civic trust that you fought to protect and and you mentioning just now. So do you have any major concerns about journalism and media in the in the big in the big picture? Well, I have tre- tremendous concerns. I've written a column since 1971, and uh, some of these columns address the question you just raised. Number one, a newspaper is only as good as the quality number of its reporters, and if they cut the staff the way some of these newspapers in Torrington, Litchfield. I mean, a Torrington registered citizen is on the ropes. It's owned by a conglomerate and only has one full-time reporter. One full-time reporter. She runs around uh, tiring herself out day after day. Uh, It used to have several reporters. Uh, In my hometown, Winston, we had a daily newspaper six days a week. There were times when the front page was similar to the New York. They had world news National, local, AP, UPI uh, c- came six days a week, and now there's there's not a, it's not even a weekly. So there is a serious decline, and that means that the informa- the, the the citizens aren't connected with one another. They don't know what's going on in, in town hall. They don't know what's going on with their service clubs uh, or activities for children. Uh, it, it strip mines the community of the essential binding nature that's required and can be filled by a newspaper. The other criticism I have is uh, that there's too much entertainment. Okay, you know, you got to have 
art style and others. Uh, NPR has plenty of entertainment, too much by my book. But you got to have coverage of civic activity. The New York Times, which is seen as the, the master newspaper in the country by many, is turning itself into a magazine. It has huge photographs, much larger than necessary, uh, taking up space. It, it has great features uh, for prizes, but it doesn't cover civic activity in New York City. I've talked to the editors, uh, and I said, you know, you have an art section, a special art section every day, seven days a week. Why don't you have a, a civic activity section one day a week? Oh, well, you can't make it pay. or so. no, I said, nonsense. You can't make it pay. You could go easily make I showed them how you could make it pay. Uh, that's not the point. They get a lot of advertisement in other sections that can support reporting uh, what some of the thousands of citizen groups in Manhattan, Brooklyn, the Bronx, uh, other boroughs are doing, try to improve their neighborhood. Well, they say, well, circulation is down. Well, why wouldn't it be down if, if, if they, they never see their community covered? Uh, that's part of increasing circulation. And so I think uh, uh, it, it, you see it everywhere. You see it on PBS where they used to interview on tax matters the head of Citizens for Tax Justice, who really knew what he was talking about, Robert McIntyre, when McNeil Lair were, were uh, the anchors. Now they interview reporters. They don't interview civic groups. Or they'll interview an academic or a think tank or some company uh, uh, person. Uh, they're, they're excluding the civic community big time. This is very serious. Local journalism, national journalism, that excludes the fountainhead of democratic success in this country, small d strong democracy, which is it all starts with the citizens. Every major progress in our country started with one or two people talking with one another, and then it grew into a movement. Then it got the attention of the politicians and the courts, and whether it's the civil rights movement or progressive taxation or the union labor movement, women's suffrage, anti-slavery, abolition movement. I mean, it's very, very clear. Democracy starts with civic engagement by ordinary people beginning to do extraordinary things. And if they do not have a voice in the media, the media is shutting down the fountainhead of democracy. And, uh, and public radio and public broadcasting have got to pay attention to that because they are not excluded from the trends that I've been describing. You've been listening to consumer advocate and former presidential candidate, Ralph Nader. He's out with a new book, The Rebellious CEO. Stay with us. We'll continue this conversation after a quick break. You can join us. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Catherine Shen. We're back with Ralph Nader discussing a wide array of topics, including his new book, The Rebellious CEO. And for our listeners, you can join the conversation. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. So, Ralph, you co-authored a letter to President Joe Biden in late October urging him to pull back on military support for Israel. And after more than a month, you also wrote an op-ed in the Albany Herald about his silence. So have you gotten a response from the president or other elected officials since that follow-up? We got a form response, which didn't answer the issues. Um, We're dealing here with uh, Obama and Congress turning the U.S. into a co-belligerent, supporting, I don't say supporting Israel, I say supporting the most extreme anti-democratic militaristic governance of Israel by the Netanyahu regime which American Jews in great numbers are horrified by. He tried to strip the judiciary and is still trying in in, uh, Israel of its role, critical role in Israeli democracy. And so unconditional support uh, with billions of taxpayer dollars sending weapons of mass destruction uh, to the Israeli uh, regime 
which is now destroying Gaza. It's all over television, it's all over the social media. Pictures give the truth. It's massive destruction of civilians in Gaza. They're being herded south and heading toward the Egyptian border. Uh, displaying fears that they're going to be expelled uh, from what's left of their homeland. And it was all started after the October 7th assault by Hamas, which, as one Holocaust survivor told the New York Times in Israel, should never have happened because of Netanyahu's blunders. He was caught napping uh, with the Israeli defense. The Hamas fighters wouldn't have gone afoot into Israel. If the, uh, if the automated controls, detections, and uh, military were alert, but they weren't. They were asleep at the switch. So how, how many Palestinian civilian lives have to pay for that kind of military blunder? How many $14.3 billion is Biden going to charge the U.S. taxpayer, uh, which I call a genocide tax, uh, to further the destruction of Gaza and its Palestinian people uh, because of Netanyahu's uh, colossal de defense uh, and intelligence uh, blunder. Now, it started with the orders by the defense minister and others in the far-right extremist coalition in Israel saying on October 8th, no food, no water, no medicine, no fuel, no electricity, nothing, nothing is going to be allowed uh, in the ongoing blockade, which is, was going on for 16 years of Gaza for the Palestinian people. Those are explicit genocidal words conforming to the exact language of the Genocide Convention, which was arrived at in 1949, born of the Holocaust, in World War II, exact words. And they're more than words. They're being implemented by Israeli F-16s, artillery, <clears throat> tanks, day in and day out, starvation, lack of water, diarrhea, dysentery, disease, babies dying, children's dying, no shelter for 85% of the 2.3 million. They're out in the elements. They're being pushed here and there, They're being told by the Israeli military, go there, go there. They go there. They're still bombed, attacked. They can't even bury their bodies. They're piled up, being eaten by stray dogs, babies in incubators, no electricity, dying. And the, the, the figures that are given, seventeen, eighteen thousand dollars 18000 dollars excuse me, seventeen to 18000 lives is a gross undercount. As I wrote in my letter, what if this was happening to Philadelphia, which is about the same area as the Gaza Strip, as a million and a half people, and you had 25,000 uh, bombs, missiles dropping on schools and uh, water mains, hospitals, healthcare facilities, uh, places of worship, uh, marketplaces, Cropland, even cropland is being destroyed, what little there is in Gaza growing food, uh, ambulances, apartments, homes, uh, and there, there is no medicine, no hospitals, uh, nothing, no aid hardly coming in from the outside. How many people in Philadelphia you think would be dying? There'd be tens of thousands. They're dying from, not only from the bombs, they're dying from the consequences of starvation and spreading disease, measles, the lack of medicine for diabetics, for cancer victims, the lack of any transport, no hospital facilities working except one. And, and we're in, all this is being done in our name, in violation of international law, even violation of U.S. law, which says that no military weapons should be sent to any country that uses it for offensive purposes or violating human rights. Well, there's a principle of international law that says if you're attacked, you have to, you cannot disproportionately counterattack and kill all kinds of innocent civilians that had nothing to do whatsoever 
with the attack, like the Hamas attack, which was totally preventable if the uh, Netanyahu regime wasn't caught napping. Well, so I'm where not- is this going to where is this going to end up? It's going to end up possibly in a larger war. We have aircraft carriers off the coast. This could involve U.S. soldiers. Another endless war. So we have to focus on Senator Blumenthal and Senator Murphy and Congressman John Larson and others and say, st- go for a ceasefire now. Stop the slaughter and start negotiations for a two state solution, which you and the White House have been for for years, but never exerted any muscle to make happen. And I think many of us are grappling with everything that you just shared now and want to move to a different kind of mobilization. We've been talking about civic mobilization earlier, and we know students here in Connecticut on Connecticut campuses are leading many protests, criticizing the U.S. response to the war between Israel and Palestine. So I want to ask you, what are your feelings about the importance of student movements in this moment? You know, what are your hopes or concerns about the faith young people have in civic institutions and civic duty? Well, it's it's encouraging that they're, you know, leaving their screens and going out and peacefully protesting and debating the issues. Uh, Jewish Voice for Peace, uh, if not now, are wonderful organizations. Uh, they're very, very courageous. They're very smart in the way they uh, do their nonviolent civil disobedience, Grand Central Station, Statue of Liberty, Congress, uh, other students are uh, joining them. Um, And it's disgraceful that that describing an ongoing genocidal uh, devastation of what the Israeli newspaper Haaretz has regularly called the defenseless civilian Palestinians is called anti-Semitic. That is a disgraceful dilution of a word that came out of the Russian pogroms and the Nazi Holocaust, and now they're cheapening the use of that word and stifling free speech, which is uh, something that should be brought to the attention of the American Civil Liberties uh, Union and its Connecticut chapter. They have been too quiet on this in contrast to the uh, courageous Center for Constitutional Rights. Now, I think part of it, Catherine, is it, it's seen as sort of a catalyst that if young people are, are fed up with these endless wars. They're fed up with student debt that piles on with usurious interest rates that's coming at them. Uh, they're fed up with the priorities that are here at home that are being neglected, whether it's our public services our social safety net, you know, it's, it's all sort of coming together with a cowardly Congress and an indentured White House. And uh, I don't know how it's going to affect next November. It may affect it in a very negative way where young people stay home. If young people st- stayed home in, in the numbers that they didn't stay home in 2020, Biden's in trouble. Well, I wanted in to... spite of the tyrant Trump and his horrific uh, positions, words, threats, you name it, what a, what a choice we have. Well, with what you just mentioned, too, I, I did want to ask, too, looking ahead to 2024 election and beyond, you know, what role might third party p- candidates play? And especially, you know, we talking about young people may or may not come out because of all the reasons you just listed. But so many people are now uh, deeply politically polarized. Can any third party ever make a real headway with voters today? Well, as I know better than most people from experience, the, the, the state laws are very uh, inimical to third party getting their candidates on the ballot very hard. A lot of petitions, a lot of obstacles, a lot of opposition by the party, the major party that feels uh, challenged. Uh, They know how to file lawsuits. The Democrats filed over 20 lawsuits in a few weeks in 2024 against us in many states trying to frivolously block us from giving 
people more choices and voices. I mean, how anti-democratic can you get? Uh, you know, if they if they don't like the Green Party, why don't they look at the Green Party's agenda and see what appeal that agenda has and take it away from them? The way Harry Truman did from Henry Wallace in 1948, who started a progressive third party. Uh, so I, I think in, anybody who wants to start a party should have the right to do so in the United States of America. It's part of free speech, assembly, and petition. It's the consummate use of the First Amendment. You can oppose it, you can support it, but never so take people, just tell people not to do it, because that's like saying, shut up, uh, and that isn't what the First Amendment is all about. So I hope uh, students do not stay home if they don't want to vote for the Democrat Republican, they can vote for the Green Party, the Libertarian Party, or they can write in their own name or if they, just to say they voted, but no confidence in any of the candidates. Or they could write in their preferred candidate, some somebody they think should be on the ballot. The well, worst thing is to stay home and drop out of democracy. And on that note, too, we the Democratic Party is leaning hard into voter fears of Trump getting reelected. There's a lot of you know thought there for for voters. But does the party need to be doing more to galvanize support or to get people to come out to vote? You know, what are your thoughts there? Huge more. Uh, the, the, de- the Democrats have been very derelict. It's like they have 12 arrows in their quiver and they're using three. Uh, Mark Green and I, in 2022, you know, he almost became mayor of New York, but Bloomberg outspent him. Um, We organized 24 civic leaders for a Zoom call with Democratic congressional candidates. Uh, John Larson endorsed it, and uh, Jamie Raskin endorsed it, Hakeem Jeffries, uh, Jim McGovern from Massachusetts. Uh, And it was tremendous uh, free suggestions about policies, tactics, uh, language, uh, slogans, how to get out the vote, how to appeal to conservative and liberals uh, who all bleed the same way when they're ripped off or harmed by corporate abuses, et cetera. And uh, very few candidates showed up on the Zoom call. And we tried after that July Zoom call in 2022 uh, to get to a lot of the candidates, but we couldn't get through the force field of their corporate conflicted political media consultants. Kathleen Curry in uh, Connecticut, a very astute uh, political, politically savvy person, says that when these consultants lose, they blame the, the candidates. They never blame themselves. And they also have corporate clients. So they're, they're in a cross, cross mix here, conflict. And so I advise people to go to winningamerica.net. You'll see that six-hour presentation by 20, 24 or so civic leaders and everywhere from pension rights to environment, consumer, labor, campaign, finance, climate, you name it, uh, corporate crime. Um, and you can get access to the report free it's 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 called crushing the GOP 2022, and they wouldn't listen. As a result, they lost the House of Representatives to the worst GOP in modern history: Teddy Roosevelt, Dwight Eisenhower, Senator Robert Taft. They they couldn't believe today's uh, ignorant, greedy, stupefying, power concentrating, anti-worker, anti-children, anti-women anti-environment GOP in Washington. I mean, if they can't landslide them, the Democrats better look at themselves in the mirror and stop looking at scapegoats like the Green Party, which gets a minuscule vote. They ought to look at winningamerica.net. It was a major civic effort by citizen groups to say, look, Democrats, and you know, you're all we have, really. It's either that or Trump. So wake up. All of these issues, minimum wage, extension of the child tax credit, increasing benefits of Social Security, Congressman Larson has been the leader of in the House Ways and Means Committee, but not getting through, Uh, cracking down on corporate crime, changing the monstrous tax system that's 
letting big corporations pay minuscule taxes and, and the super rich pay lower taxes and redirecting our public budgets to necessities back home, et cetera, et cetera. These appeal uh, to liberal and conservative families, liberal and conservative voters. And it's just totally puzzling that, that the Democratic Party, in order to keep raising more commercial corporate campaign money than the Republicans, have basically shelved these long FDR New Deal platforms, updated. So people listening, go to winningamerica.net to see what I mean. Well, and with all of your experiences, and you also were involved with many citizen groups, and you mentioned Mark Green earlier, who's one of your early Nader Raiders. I want to touch on, you demonstrate in, in so many ways a really abiding faith in American government and and the ability to work, however doggedly, within the system to really affect and make change. And so Mark Green was quoted in the 20 or the 2006 documentary about you, An Unreasonable Man, saying that you are the embodiment of the ethic, you can fight City Hall. So do you have concerns, Ralph, about dwindling faith in civic institutions and civic duty, you know, as we talk about mobilization here? Well, you know, you wouldn't be asking that question if we had good civic education in our schools where they were taught civic skills, given civic experience in their own community, town halls, improving their own community, uh, we'd have a different country. Uh, and uh, it's, it's very important in terms of people who are disenchanted or dis, dis, discouraged to learn one fact about American history at its best. Almost all the blessings that we have inherited from our forebears, except maybe the GI Bill of Rights, were started by a handful of citizens who got together, abolition movement, women's right to vote, the right of workers to form unions, all the way through to the consumer uh, protection, environmental uh, movements uh, recently. Uh, and it's never taken more than 1%. This is the astonishing fact. It's never taken more than 1% of committed citizens connecting one another in congressional districts, knowing what they're talking about, reflecting public opinion, focusing on the decision maker, say Congress or the state legislature, to defeat these corporations and all these special interest lobbyists. We got the auto industry regulated in terms of safer cars, less polluting cars, more fuel efficient cars, with the help of people like Senator Abraham Ribicoff, Senator Warren Magnuson in the 1960s. We never had more than a thousand people around the country constantly supporting us, contacting their members of Congress. Less than 1%. Isn't that an encouraging piece of information? And you can do that for universal health insurance. You can do that for living wage. You can do that for revising the tax system, for waging peace, international arms control, and environmental treaties are greatly needed, reducing the bloated, corrupt military contracting budget uh, and, and transferring it to community restoration and public services and public works. We know what the priorities are needed. We need more community health clinics that focus on prevention. We need better nutrition for our families and our children. We need cleaner air and water. All these are uh, available with solutions on the shelf that aren't being applied because there's a democracy gap. And Catherine, that democracy gap falls on all our shoulders. It's when we stay home and don't go to a town meeting, when we don't inform ourselves before we go to vote, when we don't go to invitations by citizen groups desperate for more members and support, whether they're food co-ops or local drinking water safety improvement groups or groups opposing bigotry and civil rights and civil liberty violations. Uh, we have to carve out a little of our time every day or every week for our civic duties, along with the time we put on our jobs with our family and with recreation. Otherwise, a breaking up of our democratic society, which we're witnessing everywhere, especially under the Trump uh, regime, uh, is going to lead to anarchy. 
It's going to lead to the destruction of the rule of law. We know what that means when we uh, study the history uh, overseas of what happens when that starts breaking down because people are spending too much time looking at screens instead of looking at one another, asking how they can improve their community, state, nation, and world. Well, we we love ending conversations with with inspirational uh, stories. So that's great advice, Ralph. Make time for civic duty. And we've also been having a lot of conversations here about starting the civic education earlier here in Connecticut schools. So got a little hope there, Ralph. And uh, you've also said before that you don't care about your reputation or even your personal legacy, but. I still want to ask, what would you want your story to inspire in people? You know, what do you want to be remembered for, Ralph? Well, it's really the subject of my little paperback, Breaking Through Power. It's easier than we think. One person can make a difference. Two people can make more of a difference. A hundred people can make more of a difference. What are we waiting for? You always try to do things that no one can stop you from doing because of our Constitution and our traditions before you meet uh, the opposition of the lobbies. It's like, uh, to use baseball lingo, uh, you walk or you hit a single, you hit a double, uh, and then you start getting uh, a better pitcher in to oppose the batters. But don't give up on yourself. Don't start thinking, it ain't going to happen. There's too much power in in the hands of the big boys. Uh, Why should we even try? shame on us if we do that. And we should remember our forebears who were uh, far more courageous. They they didn't say uh, those things and give excuses for themselves when they demonstrated and picketed and sat in on the auto plants to get the UAW, uh, United Auto Workers, organized or uh, fought against slavery. They, uh, uh, they had a higher estimate of their own significance, Catherine. And that's what I ask citizens to do, have a higher estimate of their own significance, because it takes a lot less civic power than we think to turn our country around, because we have many solutions we don't apply to the problems on the ground that we don't deserve. We should easily abolish poverty by a living wage, number one, by full health insurance, number two, by a fairer tax system. Number three, and by respecting family values with paid family sick leave, paid worker sick leave, paid child care. If countries in Western Europe and Canada can do this, why can't the so-called wealthiest country in the world can do it? Well, Ralph, you're leaving us with a lot of food for thought here. And and wrapping up, speaking of uh, making voices heard, you're still hosting a podcast yourself, right? Can you tell us a little bit about yeah. it and where can our listeners find you? Yeah, it's called the Ralph Nader Radio Hour dot com or dot org. The Ralph Nader Radio Hour. It's on the Bridgeport Community Radio in Connecticut, six p.m. Sunday, uh, and uh, uh, it's in, on about forty-five radio stations. And of course, uh, it's on a podcast, which goes up about Saturday noon every week. I've had it since 2015. We have a lot of people on who don't get much voice, major authors, uh, major scholars, major civic activists and leaders. Amazing the ideas they have. We had a person on from Texas, and his his, uh, uh, his, uh, thing is to encourage people to use local referendums. He has a map of the United States where all kinds of towns and States have local referendums. They call them initiatives in the Western states where people can be their own legislature. They put a, a reform on the ballot and uh, and they vote it in. And Connecticut doesn't have much of a state referendum, but it has a lot of towns with local. And his whole effort is to say to people, wake up, you got the power in your own hands, you're not using it. Well, if that doesn't wake us up, I don't know what will. Well, I really appreciate you, Ralph, mentioning uh, your guest being really interesting. I certainly have an amazing time here on this show with our guest, including yourself. And for our listeners, you've been listening to Ralph Nader, whose new book, The Rebellious CEO, is available now. Ralph, thank you so much for your time and for spending time with us today. 
Well, thank you very much, Catherine. And in terms of newspapers, we, we put out periodically the CapitalHillCitizen.com. It's 40 pages. And you want to get it, you'll see all kinds of stories on your Congress, the most powerful institution in the world that you don't read about in the regular press, CapitalCitizen.com. Thank you for this opportunity to speak to the residents of my native Connecticut. You can listen to our extended conversation at ctpublic.org slash where we live or on your favorite podcast app. I'm Catherine Shen. Today's show is produced by Katie Pellico. Our technical producer is Kat Pastor. And a quick reminder to our listeners that we are in the middle of our December Pledge Drive. And here are two of my colleagues with more.